Hello, Nicholas Vince here, and I'm very excited to be with you here today. We have a very rare and very special guest on our Halloween edition of the Chattering Hour. I'm talking about John Carpenter alumni Nancy Loomis. Nancy starred in Assault on Precinct 13, Halloween 1, 2 and 3, and in The Fog. All of this has made Nancy Loomis horror royalty. Up next on the Chattering Hour, Nancy Loomis. We're back, and again, here is that list of films you're going to recognise. Assault on Precinct 13, Halloween 1, 2 and 3 and The Fog. I am so pleased to be joined today by Nancy Loomis in a very, very rare interview. Um, thank you so much for joining me today. So I just wanted to, let's roll back to the very beginning. Well, not really the very beginning, I guess, but I was wondering how you met John Carpenter and Deborah Hill. I, I met John when he was just out of film school at USC and and I was I had just come to Los Angeles and had no film experience so I signed up down at USC to to get some film experience I wasn't taking classes but I let the people who were um, know that I was available to be in their student films right and and through that um, I auditioned for Tommy Wallace, who is a good friend of John. Right. And, and then was my husband for a good number of years and the father of my children. So I met Tommy Wallace. Um, and, and that was uh, the first film I ever made was with Tommy Wallace while he was a graduate student at USC. And so through Tommy, I, I became friends with John and they're old friends from high school. Wow. And and we all kind of lived in the same neighborhood for years and and hung out with other people that, you know, whose names you might might have heard of. Also, Nick Castle was in that crowd and Dan O'Bannon and 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 quite a few other people. Right. So it, that really, for, for me, was the beginning of my association with John and, and John used to um, for some reason he had, he, he managed to get a, a 35 millimeter projector out of USC and into his apartment, his tiny little apartment in Beechwood Canyon. And, and, and he and his, his girlfriend at the time would, would have these screenings. And in his little living room, there would be a, he had a big projector and, and, and a big screen. And it was amazing to go. And, and of course, he was really into John Ford and Howard Hawks. And that was the first time I'd, I'd ever really seen those movies by those film directors, those great film directors from the 30s, you know, that close up, that big of a screen. And I didn't even have a, a television at the time, you know. So it, it, was, it, it was an education for me right. to be introduced to this kind of Panavision, you know, and to really understand how the camera moves because you couldn't escape it. You, you know, you were so close to the screen. And so I just thought, wow, this is so cool, you know. <laughs> I so it, I really had a good time at 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 those at those social gatherings, mm -hmm. right? And and then it just transpired that John got got some funding to through Dark Star, which was his um, school film project that he right. turned into a feature film yes, and, and, and through that there came some funding to to make Assault on Precinct 13 and we were friends by that time so right so then he invited me to participate and I was thrilled to do that so did he invite you to because you've got two credits on Assault Thir on Precinct 13 yeah which you've is... done your homework man <laughs> I do my best. I do my best. Because <laughs> <laughs> your dad is both wardrobe mistress and playing Julie. So which came first? Was it the wardrobe mistress or the act? I, I, I think he offered me the part. 
he, he, you know, I think, I think the budget on that film was like 75 grand, you know, it was really small. And so he was just gathering his friends together. Hey, want to make a movie? And, and um, there were a few people at that time, Deborah Hill being one of them who mm. had, had some serious professional experience and was kind of running the place because they, they kind of knew the logistical planning that, you know, but anyway, um, I think that's how that happened. And then I said, well, do you need a costumer? Because I'm really good at that. I've been doing that for a long time. And, you know, I have all this theatrical training where you learn how to do everything in the theater. And so I, you know, I, I even knew how to pull focus by that time and could work as a second assistant director or a first assistant. But I, I, uh, cause when you work in non-union films and you're just, you know, you're doing everything on a student show and you learn how to do everything in theater from paint props to build sets and make costumes. So I, yeah, they just, they, 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 uh, they were happy to have somebody, you know, they, that was one thing they could check off their list. Okay, we got a costumer, you know? <laughs> <laughs> so that's how that worked. Right, 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 right. So what was the kind of the spirit of this on the set? It kind of sounds, everyone is equal and we're, we're just gonna make a movie, is that right? Pretty much, yeah. Although John, John was very, um, you know, he was very much engaged in in performing the role of the director, right? You know, and 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 making. He knew he was in charge, and he was in charge, and he he really was um, very uh, focused on doing the things that a good director does, making decisions and 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 taking charge of how the thing was moving forward. So um, that gave everybody quite a bit of confidence. Who knows what was going on behind the scene? But, but he really um, made sure that, uh, that the dailies you know, that were coming in um, were, you know, he, was he was tracking that very carefully and holding those cards kind of close to his chest. Right. But, but um, in every respect, he, he was really in that role and he, he was quite comfortable in it. So right. uh, I, I think, uh, you know, everyone was just doing what needed to be done. It wasn't a big union show. So, mm. you know, somebody, you know, I remember driving down into East LA to the Coca-Cola bottling plant to find a Coke machine that we needed for one of the scenes. I don't, you know, so I was just doing whatever had to be done and dressing the set and and everyone was doing that except the the, the actors, the, the big union actors like Chuck Cyphers, you know, the older actors who really had, they were just, they were sort of the, what would you call it? They, the, they were like the grounding elements, the people who who really could like, hit their marks and say their lines and no problem, you know? Mm. Yeah. And they sort of inspired the rest of us. Ah, it's always great when you can work with more experienced people, isn't it? It's a great yeah. way of learning just by observing and being with them and so on. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Now, I'd like to move on to Halloween and the other films you've made with John, but before we do, um, I know that you're not a big fan of horror films. <laughs> you, you heard me rant at dinner parties. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's fair enough. No, I get that. You're not, you know, you're not alone in, in my guest. So which film directors do you admire? Which film directors do you watch? Or what sort of films do you watch? Well, I, I, have, I, have a, I think I have a fairly eclectic taste, actually. And and it might sound a little weird, but um, I'm really a big fan of, of uh, Akira Kurosawa. You know, I, I and and even though some people might say, well, you know, that's pretty close to horror films, if you ask me. But you know, but I I like that scope, you know, that he 
he brings. Um, but even in his early films, those early black and white films he made right after World War II, when he was, you know, really sort of getting going. Mm. Um, I, I just, I, his, his ability to capture the psychic moment to me is just, <laughs> it's fantastic. So, and so that's sort of where I, 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 I sit, but really the person, I think the director who drew me in to film as a medium and helped me understand it as an art form, um, where I wasn't just uh, an appreciative spectator mm -hmm. for the content of the movie, but someone who, who actually, or maybe it was just me, who, who actually helped me see uh, that somebody was behind that camera making a bunch of decisions, right? Mm -hmm. and, that, and that it wasn't just fantasy, total fantasy, right? Mm -hmm. But that was Jean Renoir, Rules of the Game. When I saw that film as a very young college student and, and I took a film class and that was part of the film class. And that was where I began to see, oh, um, I see this whole thing is a construct, just like a play. And, and up until then I was so naive. I had no idea how filmmaking happened. I thought it was total magic, you know? Does that make sense? Yeah, that makes perfect you know that sense. Experience? Yeah, no, it's interesting. You, um, many moons ago in a previous incarnation of doing YouTube interviews, I interviewed Andrew Robinson, oh. uh, who was in Hellraiser, Dirty Harry, uh, et cetera. And I was asking him the same question. And I asked him to choose a film and it was Seven Samurai. <laughs> and we had we spent a long and I realized I'd not seen Seven Samurai until I, until that moment. I didn't I knew about it, obviously. But I, I know exactly what you mean about the scope of Kurosawa. It's, yeah. it's but you have these big sweeping things. I'm just thinking in um Seven Samurai, there's a hilltop and they're putting the swords in the ground after some of them die, and it's just silhouetted and it's gorgeous. But you get the psychic moment, you know exactly what's going on in the heads of all those characters. Yeah, and, and part of it is his pacing, I think, you know, yeah. he he's not afraid to have this ritual pacing. And and that comes from the that comes from no theater, that comes from the earliest theatrical traditions in Japan. And he had a deep appreciation of no. And when you watch no, it's almost like the whole thing is in slow motion. Mm. And, and so it puts it it invites the spectator into this really open headspace it's so meditative mm -hmm. and then your imagination just pours in and fills in the rest but it's very different than than uh, uh, you know a hollywood movie where it's like yeah. every 15 seconds something's going to happen yeah you know? yeah we have our beats we have our structure and this is <laughs> yeah 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 no, so okay. you know but then again, I, I appreciate American film. You know, I, mm. I really appreciate Spike Lee, for instance. I think he's a brilliant filmmaker and, and, um, and Howard Hawks, as I said, but, but I just have such a range. You know who I really, really like is Mike Lee. And, and I'm sure you know Mike Lee's mm -hmm. film. But, you know, I, I think Mr. Turner is just a genius film. And, <laughs> and I could watch it over and over. I have watched it over and over. <laughs> over again so, ah, interesting. So I, I really I, I really uh, just admire people who can manipulate the form in unexpected and you know really dramatic ways yeah yeah I think interesting well that's that's great that's a few more films on my watch list because I've never actually sat down and watched Mr. Turner I'm aware of it and it's Timothy Spall um, playing Mr. Turner i I he's fantastic. He's oh, he's just a great. About my favorite actor. He can do anything. <laughs> I was watching him, uh, Burden of Truth, um, and he can play un really unsympathetic characters, and there's such humanity to them. Yes, it's his face, isn't it? I mean, it's just his face. Just, just amazing. <laughs> just amazing. Anyway. Let's move, we should move on to that. Move on. <laughs> but it's great. That's, that's, thank you very much for that. That's really fascinating. So in 1978, you got to play Annie 
uh, in a John Carpenter film in Halloween. So how did that come about that you got to play Annie? Well, I think it just came about because I was there, you know, I, I, I it was a, one more decision that nobody had to worry about. And they said, right. oh, you want to play this part? We're writing this movie. And it's just like, of course I want to play the part. I'm an actress, you know, looking to make it big in Hollywood. And, and, and so the, Deborah and Deborah Hill and John were, were busy writing this and, and, and uh, everybody was sort of gearing up to, to go make another wonderful John Carpenter film and have a lot of fun. And, and um, so that, that was more or less just, I think from the very beginning, um, gonna be a part that I was gonna play. And so it was sort of tailored to what John thought was, was he appreciated my sense of humor at the time, which, you know, I is, was pretty sarcastic, I think, you know, I had a lot of big defense mechanisms built up and, and, and I was sort of using sarcasm as a way, as a, as a way to, you know, keep people at bay. You know? Deal with, yeah. Yeah, deal with the world. Yeah. So, so John sort of constructed a character around that, and ah, and that became Annie, and 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 that's how that happened. It it it, uh, it was still a very sort of in-house ex experience. Yeah. We had a little bit more money than Assault on Precinct Thirteen, and the so the level of professionalism was was a, you know a few notches higher, and it 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 was. It was a real opportunity for many people who were trying to get into the union and really reach that plateau. It, it was an opportunity for many of those people. And, and, you know, Deborah Hill was instrumental in helping so many people in that cast and the crew to, to get into the union, especially people in the cast. I mean, in the crew, she, she really went to bat for people who were just, you know, right there, um, ready to be in the union. And and uh, and so, you know, she's really appreciated mm. uh, for that. Yeah, that job she did. Yeah, yeah. Mm. And I mean, you know, the character of Annie Brackett has gone on to become one of the most beloved characters. <laughs> in <laughs> isn't it amazing? <laughs> <laughs> does that excite you? Does that confuse you? Does oh that... yes, it does. You know, it. I. Because really, until I started going to these horror conventions, I had no idea. I, I hadn't even thought about Halloween for like a zillion years. And 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 then one day, Adrienne called up and said, "You know, there's this thing going on out in the world that you might be interested in." And and I knew that Halloween was a cult film, but until the internet, you know, it it was mm -hmm. still a cult film. So so the the way to hook up with it was pretty, you know. Um, it, you had to really dig deep, you know, in the bins at the video rental stores because there weren't even were there even videos then? There were there, there weren't DVDs. They were VCRs or something. VCR. But yeah. anyway, yeah. But but then you know, in the mid '90s or late '90s, Adrian calls up and says, "Well, there's this thing going on. You might be interested in it." Maybe it was the early 2000s. I don't remember. But anyway, when I went to the first film convention that I mean the horror convention then I was absolutely shocked and and it was really the fans who were telling me what my what my character was like and the lines I said and you remember this and you remember that that started to jog my memory so like oh yeah I did that yeah that was really fun and and, and so my whole appreciation, not only for that character, but but everything that we were doing at that time, and and all of John's work and Deborah's work, and and the filmmakers themselves, Dean Cundy and Tommy Wallace and Craig Stearns, all those folks, I, I just really began to revisit it in a way I never had experienced before, and and uh, I began to appreciate it all over again in a right. completely new way. Right. But it still wasn't enough to really like 
make me drop everything and go explore the genre of horror films. <laughs> you know what I mean? I was really in a whole other headspace by that time. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yes, that must be. I can I can appreciate that because you know, I left the business for a while um, to go off and earn money. You know, actor earn money. Um, yeah. <laughs> It's like I ended up in computers for years. Um, and I, I understand that. I completely get that. But coming back to the movie for just a moment, I just want to say one of the, my favorite lines is, hey, jerk, speed kills. <laughs> now, I've seen that all over on T-shirts and bumper stickers and so on. Was right. that part of the original script? You know, I think it was. It. I don't know if it was... If John wrote it or Deborah wrote it, Deborah wrote a lot of the really funny lines that that I said, but um, I don't think we made that up on the spot. Right. I don't know. Maybe maybe we did, but as I recall, it was already in the in the script. Um, I, I'm pretty sure I didn't write it. Right. Right. I wrote other lines, but I I didn't write that one. And and. Uh, but yeah, I, that was a line I'd completely forgotten about until I showed up at the horror conventions and, and somebody reminded me. And they also reminded me that I sang this song and which I had completely forgotten about. I sing a song into the telephone or something. I don't quite remember. Yes, you do. I remember, yes, you do. I can't remember yeah. what the song is. My boyfriend or something. I don't know. Or maybe I'm just singing it. But... Um, but then the, the fans really were curious about that moment. They wanted to know all about that moment. And I had no clue. So they sang the song for me. And then it was like, oh, yeah, I did do that. And that was a lot of fun. And we just made that up on the spot, right? It, that, the, the crew was throwing out lines. Everybody was throwing out lines so we could just keep going. And it was so much fun. So you made the song up on the spot to the on line? The spot. Absolutely. The tune, the song, the, the lyrics, everything. The whole crew. It was a chorus, right? It was the whole crew was participating in that in that thing. Just like, let's do it now. <laughs> so and it really helped me because you know, I I don't, I'm not a singer. I don't um I don't think of myself as, as having any kind of singing voice. So to sing in, on a camera, I mean, I'm really scared, right? And so they really, that whole experience of support really got me through it, you know? And so yeah. the fact that they that fans remember that to me is just like, oh my God, you're kidding. This is what I'm gonna be remembered for, my horrible voice. <laughs> But that, that is lovely. I just, I've never been asked to sing. I mean, I've sung on stage, I've done musicals and, and, and so on. Wow. But yeah, and no, I never had to sing on film. Yeah, that must be very intimidating. I can imagine that singing on film must be yeah, very no rehearsal, absolutely cold. That's probably oh, the only wow. way I could have gotten through it. Wow, wow. <laughs> Fascinating. And you it's also, and the other great thing about Halloween is you've got to work with Jamie Lee Curtis and PJ Souls. How was it working with those ladies? Yeah, it was it was a wonderful experience to to work with those those young women at the time because that um, they're both they're very different, but we all, all three of us really appreciated what what. Uh, what Deborah was trying to do and John was trying to do. And, and we knew we had a responsibility to sort of bond with each other and create a, the camaraderie that was gonna show up on the camera. So there was a professional aspect to it, but there was also just this um, r real sense of, of trust and freedom mm -hmm. in, in uh, hanging out with each other and that's that's really what it was, and and it, it 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 was that way not just with the three of us, um, but really with so many aspects of that film, um, it all the good energy that was generated during the making of that film, as stressful as it was in many respects, is it's, it's up there on the screen. Hmm. There's tremendous production value in every shot. 
And, and, and I think that comes from the kind of energy that was there and certainly working with, with Jamie and PJ um, to be part of that team, you know, it shows. Mm. And they're mm. wonderful people, you know, in real life. Right. And right. I don't see Jamie really at all, but, but um, I see PJ quite a bit because she goes to these conventions also. Right. She's wonderful. She's really a wonderful woman. Yeah. Yes. And I value my convention friends. It's, you know, one is so lucky to kind of meet people you know, yeah. and reform friendships from like 30 odd years ago. Yeah. It's your case more. Yeah. And that's how I met you. I, know. <laughs> yeah. I forget where Dallas or Atlanta or someplace. <laughs> I was talking, I was talking to Tracy Lords about this. It's just like they all become the same. Don't they? It's like, yeah. It's a big hotel room with bad lighting. Yeah. <laughs> But a lot of wonderful people show up. Yeah, no, I, I'm very, I miss them. I mean, yeah, yeah. But hopefully next year, we shall be able to do more of these things. Go back to the film for a moment. Now, your death scene in... Um, yeah. <laughs> it's pretty remember. It's actually beautifully done because we, you're talking about singing into the phone because there's this beautiful long lead up. You know he's in the house. I say he, I mean, Tony Moran in this case, yeah. is yeah. in the house yeah. somewhere. Michael Myers is in that, but you're just never sure where he is and quite when it's going to happen. How did that, again, was that in the script or how did that whole death scene come about? Well, it, it, was, it was pretty well organized and set up by that point because it was towards the end of, of shooting and um, I, I rehearsed it. I knew that I was going to have to scream. And that's really what I was focused on, you know, just the technical parts of it. And, and I, um, I was most concerned because if you remember, I don't know if you remember, but in that shot, there's, there's a, a lot of mist. Mm, mm. Okay, yeah. which is really toxic chemical that's oh. released. And even a little bit of it just um, what made it really hard to talk, much less scream. It's and and right. it was just hard to even be in the same room with all this fog because it was so toxic. And so I just wanted the scene over with as fast as possible. And, and I think that I think we only did like two takes and that was it. Thank goodness. Mm -hmm. So um, once again, you just, and I don't know if that contributed to my stellar performance in, in that I was just like dying anyway of the fog <laughs> of the smoke <laughs> machine um, that it just made it look really real, but that's what it was. <laughs> get me out of here <laughs> yeah yeah i completely appreciate that because i remember my memory of the set of hellraiser is the smell of the smoke machine yeah you know because they always put it in you know horror movie there's one around there's always going to be one around and then i remember decades later there was another smoke machine and i expected it I expected the smell again, but of course things have moved on since then. <laughs> it's a lot less toxic these days. Yeah. I think it smells uh, of strawberries. Law, it's a lot less toxic. Yeah. <laughs> I think it smells of bubble gum or strawberries or something. Well, maybe like it's good. all just just um, you know, it, uh, C -S -C CGF or whatever it is. CGI. Fake smoke. Fake oh yeah, yeah. As it imposed. Yeah. Yeah. We like that a lot. <laughs> yeah. Right. Yeah. But yeah. No, that 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 is a, a I think that is um a, a really good scene in in the film. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. It's very carefully, carefully structured and scripted. Yeah. Well it's it's the moment where she she suddenly realizes oh, there's missed this condensation. It's and it's just a it, moment. Yeah. It's, because you really well get condensation if somebody else is already yeah. beautifully yeah really yes. well edited yeah yes too. absolutely absolutely yeah. yeah and that constant build yeah of tension um i have to ask you 
Dr. Sam Loomis. Is this a nod in your direction? I guess it must be. <laughs> it, yeah, you know, John, you probably know this, but it, it once again, it's just, what can I check off my list as fast as possible? And John was always stealing the names of his friends to put in his scripts and it, it, you know, so everybody in the script in Halloween is somebody that he actually knows in real life, I think, and, or knew in his past, right? So yeah, definitely. Uh, I uh, love it, yeah. It's, it's a good name. It's a great name, and it, yes, it's a great name. It's a lot, it, yeah, no, it absolutely, it works terribly well. And well, Donald Pleasance is performance. And it goes with every every name, you know, Sam, Nancy. Yeah. You know, whatever name you want to put in front of it, it seems <laughs> it, it creates a sense of character. There's, you know, it's. Do like, you know the origin of your? No, name? it's not my real name. It's the name of my first husband, actually. Ah. Oh. No, no, my 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 given name is Kai's. Ah, eyes. Right, mm. right, 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 right. But just one of those happy accidents that it's, yeah. Yeah, but at that time, I, I, I was using that name legally. Right. So that's my name, and then I changed it back to Kai's, and you know that that was a series of hoops I had to jump through. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I know. I have a slightly different legal name to my to Nicholas Vince, and it it always causes endless fun passport and yeah yeah but anyway so i think you've talked a little bit about your your reaction to halloween it, is it really just at the fan conventions that the horror conventions that you really get to un or got to understand just what halloween means to people yeah no it, it i i really had no clue it it was you know, it was really in the far corners of the attic of my mind until out of the blue, somebody wanted to do an interview with me and I couldn't believe it. I couldn't, and, and, and uh, that was the first thing that happened, I think. But I did that, which was just a simple phone interview. And then I, that kind of disappeared off the radar. And then Adrienne called and, and said, do you know this is going on and you should get behind it? And I still couldn't believe it. And, and until I actually showed up at the first convention and Chris right. kind of held my hand I, and I, I just was shocked. And, and I was kind of in that state of shock for a, quite a while, just like, really, you know, this is amazing. And, and, uh, and then it occurred to me that the reason why this was getting to be such a phenomenon mm. was really to do with the, the web and the, the, the sort of sudden ability of everyone to be connected to everyone else. Mm. Mm. And, 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 and the birth of social media, I think, just propelled this um, real appreciation for mm. the genre in general and Halloween in particular. So it, it, then it began to make sense to me when I could connect it that way. Yeah. Now you, you mentioned Adrian a couple of times. Adrian Barbeau? Adrian Barbeau, yeah. Yes. Who yeah. you worked with on The Fog. On The Fog, right. Yeah. She's marvelous. She's really a terrific um, um, actress and, and human being. So um, I, I always love it when I run into her at, right, at right. these conventions too. And what, was yeah. it, and what was it like filming The Fog? Oh, it was so much fun. I mean, it, it, cause I, I fell in love with um, Northern California. You know, I'd really never been that far North, North of San Francisco and and so I just um, was thrilled to be out of Los Angeles and to be in this amazing place on the coast. And I just couldn't get enough of it. And, and, and then Janet Lee was part of, of the experience. I was gonna get to meet Janet Lee, which was an absolute thrill. 
and to work with her. And she really taught me a lot about acting. And, and I'm just forever grateful to her for her generosity and, and her fine, fine sense of what was just enough, you right. know, and no more. Ah. She really, really was it's just instinctually um, on the money. And Jamie Lee is the same way, really. Right. Um, just enough, what's just enough and not an iota more. And so um, we had a lot of fun, but um, they didn't let me do the costumes on that show. And <laughs> so I was just there for a couple of weeks, but I've been going back there ever since, you know, because it's, it, it really has a, a place in my heart. Just the landscape, it's magic. Yeah. It, it, it's interesting you you, um, you kind of alluded to something there saying because you were just acting you were only on the shoot for a couple of weeks as opposed to if you are doing costume then you're there throughout the entire shoot and I think that's something people don't quite understand sometimes of actors you know that you turn up for your day or your weeks or a couple of weeks right. whereas the team who are actually you now the crew yeah who are there for the entire shoot in, in probably being employed way before cameras roll. That's right. You know, yeah. it's, it's, it's a very different. Very different experience. I, I really enjoyed my time behind the camera, I think much more than I did in front of the camera. Maybe it's for that reason. I hadn't thought about that, but you're right. Yeah, because you because get- The teamwork, you know, in the theater, you're trained to work at, at, at collaboratively. That's the mm. art and it's the same in filmmaking, but, but maybe that's that's what that's so integral to my understanding of how to make art. Right, right. Yes, because of course, normally when you're rehearsing, you've got however many weeks rehearsal you've got, then you've got the run itself. So everyone's in this together from beginning to end. You don't have people dropping in to do their bit and walk away again. Yeah. Yes, yes. Yeah. That's yeah, that's pretty, yes, I'd not really thought about it in those terms before. Yeah. Cool. Now, did you mention Janet Lee? I'm just curious, did she have any Hitchcock tales to tell you? Oh, I'm sure she did, but I can't recall them. And what I do recall <laughs> is, is that um, she gave me uh, really great tips on, on jump roping because she, she used to jump rope to keep her circulation going and keep her energy up. She, she could jump rope like nobody's business. And she, she would um, do that between scenes, you know, waiting around for the, the shots to emerge. And, and uh, I was just amazed at, that she could do that. So that's what I remember. And, and she, she really taught me how to relax in front of the camera. She, she just was so generous. And, but... and, and, and she had a great sense of humor. So that's what I remember. So I'm sure she had great stories about Hitchcock, but I, I don't recall those. No, no. But I, I, he I, is one of my favorite directors, by the way. Right, right. Yeah, yeah. He's, he's an extraordinary man. But it was, I love the idea of jumping right, this whole idea of doing something to keep your energy up. I know many actors yeah. knit or they'll go away and they'll read a book or, you know, just something to calm you down. You know what Hal Holbrook did? You know, Hal Holbrook was in mm. that movie too. Yeah. And he was training himself to do rope tricks. So he was using a rope too, but he wasn't doing jump rope. He was lassoing things. And he, he was doing all these amazing rope tricks. So... <laughs> There you go. <laughs> it was just so much fun. It's, you know? it's, I, I, one has these images of people having watched them on screen and also their performance in the movies. I never associated Hal Holbrook with doing rope tricks. Right. So, That's wow. what he was doing. Cool. Yeah. Now, Moving on from um, The Frog, you carried on working with uh, John Carpenter. You even made a brief appearance in um, Halloween 2. Yes. As a dead body. <laughs> That's right. Was this, That's right. Was this just 
Nancy, will you come in for a day and just lie on the bed for us? Yeah, it was four hours of makeup for, you know, a, a 90 second one take, less than 90 seconds, four hours of makeup. So, you know, it was fine. It was, it was fun, of course, but it was, it was just that it was, yeah. it was, as you were saying before in filmmaking, really off, very often what an actor's doing is just coming in for a brief moment and then going away. And there there's, so there's no opportunity to really, um, participate other than that you're just a little tiny piece of the puzzle and you you know you 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 really don't have a sense of what the of your participation in a, in a grander scheme right? right even though you know you're doing that but yeah yeah but you don't get that same experience that you do if you're behind the camera working on, uh, intensely with this kind of you know theatrical family yeah 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 absolutely you did also make another cameo in um, Halloween 3 as a completely different character. What, what are your thoughts about, now it didn't do as well as, um, because the reason I think you're able to do that is because of course it's a completely different story. It's still set around Halloween. Yeah, and that, there was this whole theory that really um, was quite well argued at the time that there's so many different Halloween stories. You know, you mm -hmm. could tell a different story and call it Halloween, and it would be around this holiday um, that has so much complexity to it that that um, you could do this endlessly, and that the franchise could go in in that if you were if there was going to yeah. be a franchise, why couldn't it be a different Halloween story with different characters and? And that was the thinking at the time. Mm -hmm. um, but the sequel to Halloween one had already been made. And, and so the idea that, I mean, if we, if I think if they had not made that sequel when they did and, and actually jumped into this other path that could have been yeah. taken, was taken in Halloween three, yeah. that, um, who knows what it, what it would have been like. But the idea that there was even a franchise at that point is really hindsight, yeah. let's be honest. And the idea that, that, that fans were so legion that, that you could only have Michael Myers be at the center of you know, this giant franchise, that, that just wasn't um, there mm -hmm. at that time. It just wasn't, um, in from my perspective. Right. But people were thinking, okay, if we're, I mean, certainly the producers were thinking, okay, if we're going to keep this going, where could we go? But it was clear after the fact that having a, a different story with different characters for every Halloween movie that you were going to make was too complicated for for spectators. It was. It, it was, it, in other words, it, it was going to be much easier to follow yes. um, the Michael Myers character. And I mean, that's how I see it. Yeah, I think I, it's the classic thing, isn't it? It's like, we want more of the same, but different. Right. But you know, you know, the, the great television series, The Twilight Zone. Mm. And so it was sort of on that order. You, you make a right. movie. It's different every week, but you're calling it the Twilight Zone, and 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 every every show, every episode is has that Twilight Zone stamp on it. Yeah, it was that same thing. It was yeah. that same idea. Which I guess is better. Which I guess is easier to do if you know TV, where you're doing it week in, week out, and it's, you very quickly established the serial nature of the. Of, Quite, of the beast but, is, right. but yeah but no i think you're absolutely right having made halloween 2 as a, as the direct continuation of the first story it was such a left it was turn. already in that headed in that direction wasn't it yeah 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 absolutely so you as you say you did halloween 3 and then you kind of left the business um moved on yeah. from acting raised a family 
I was particularly fascinated to discover you're a sculptress. When did the sculpting start? Well, it started. It 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 started after I I I had become a mother, and and I was spending a lot of time um, sitting on the floor playing with blocks and color and you know being with my children and teaching my children about the world and and I just became interested in those very elemental aspects of art and visual art and and I um I just kind of lived in in that place for years and years and then I I um I began to make things and and I began um, collecting things and, and I was fascinated by the, the ways that my children would just amass these piles of very sort of unrelated objects. They would just, you know, piles of stuff would stack up in various corners of the house really quickly, actually. <laughs> things that you think, okay, we need to come in here and clean up. Yeah. But um, actually the piles of stuff began to fascinate me and, and how interesting all these patterns and lines and colors and objects kind of merge together. And it's like, hey, you know, and, and at a certain point, I, I just wanted to see all that stuff kind of permanently bound together to see like what it could be. And right. I, I hated glue. I absolutely couldn't stand the idea of gluing anything. And so I started weaving stuff together just to see what would happen and, and to tie things together and sometimes use the things themselves or sometimes use wire or ribbon or rope or, you know, and, 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 and I, I, I began to stack stuff up and mash it and layer it and and pretty soon I was using hundreds of objects. And now I've built sculptures with thousands of objects. Um, but that's, so I created the material out of found objects. And then I built the sculpture out of that very sort of abstract expression. But um, it really emerged from this idea of, first of all, not much sleep when you're a mom so you get in this strange headspace, right? And then just going with that and, and really out of a curiosity of, you know, what is this force that comes through children? This, this, this ability for them to really just come in like a tornado. It's entropy, you know, and just, what is that force? And I got very curious about it because they, you would, you would think you would have established some kind of order and inside of two seconds, a kid would just like, oh yeah, you think so? I think it's this, <laughs> or they're not even thinking, you know? And it's wild, but it's a force to be reckoned with. And that's what I got very curious about it. And, I'm, and that really was the impetus for my work. And it's sort of driven me all these years. 25 years now. Wow. Yeah. Wow. I, and I've seen a few pictures online and I, I, it beggars belief as far as I'm concerned that they're not actually glued together. That's no glue. No, because when, when you glue something, it really becomes fixed. And I really like to, I like the flexibility of weaving when you can, because you can manipulate the, the objects and, and the, the ways they're woven together and you can create all all kinds of wonderful shapes and forms. And, and then pretty soon the work starts to speak to you and tell you what it is. And there's a certain velocity to the whole, you know, a certain energetic value. Um, if you can stretch and pull things. Um, and, and so it, it's very satisfying in that way. It, it is very sculptural in that way. Where, whereas glue, it's just like, mm, that's it, nowhere to go. You see what I'm saying? Yes, no, I do. I, well, I would particularly pick up on the phrase, you know, it tells you what it is like, you know, the, the piece of work. Yeah. As you're exploring, you're discovering, but also there is, 
it sounds at a weird. Point, it has its own agency. It really does. It has its own agency. And that was an experience I'd never had before, certainly not in filmmaking or acting of any kind. I was really engaged with myself on a pretty deep level when I was making those discoveries, you know, and, and giving myself the freedom and, and trusting myself enough to just do those really irrational things that yeah. add up to something really so rational. So there you go. <laughs> <laughs> And are any of your pieces on permanent display anywhere, or is it just? They're privately collected. Right, I right. I don't have any that I can recall that are in museums, but privately, people, plenty of people collect them. Thank you for asking. <laughs> <laughs> I just want to see them. I just want to see them in the well, flesh. Come and they... visit, man. Come I would. I will do next year. Next year, I hope to yeah, get to you your get part to of the world. When the travel ban is lifted, come. And <laughs> yes. when they let me back in the country again um yeah. now moving on from that so kind of a, i guess out of an extension of this you now teach at cal poly uh pomona yeah I, firstly what is it you, you i think you mentioned earlier i can't remember if it was before we started whoops i'm knocking my microphone now um it's theater studies that you yes yeah so yeah. this is a complete return to my earlier training as a in theater right when i was in school i was a, a theater major right and I was really trained as an actress for the stage and um so when i decided i couldn't make a living as a visual artist i needed a day job i i decided i i needed to go back to school and get a um another degree what was I going to do if I was going to get a degree in visual art? I was going to have to start over with a bachelor's, and I didn't want to do that. And I'd had some quite a bit of experience all the time my children were growing up directing plays right. for their schools. And right. so I had a bit of teaching experience already. And I, I, was, I, I loved that. I really enjoyed it. And, and, um, and so I went, I went back uh, and got a degree in theater right. and really jumped back into that whole art form. Um, and then went to work at Cal Poly in this tiny little theater department in this big engineering school. And that's a trip, let me tell you. But, <laughs> sure. uh, but I, yeah, I, I teach, um, theater history and text analysis. I teach all these academic classes that nobody else in the department wants to teach. So, and, and I love it. It's, right. it's really fun for me to revisit the, the place where I started with this whole other perspective. Right. Um, about what you can gain from reading history and mining history for performance. and. I just love all those layers now because I'm old enough to appreciate layers of things, you know. <laughs> Sedimentary rock is really where I'm at, right? <laughs> <laughs> what, um, what, yeah, thinking of it, what is the one lesson you hope that your, your students take away from your lessons? Well, pretty much that, you know. I, I think... <sighs> My parting words to my students are all are, are always um, the words really that um, a really great teacher of um, philosophy and religion, Douglas Brooks, who is at the University of Rochester in New York, his his mantra, um, which I like to pass on to everyone, is, uh, "You are the company you keep." So keep good company. <laughs> Isn't that wonderful? It's great. <laughs> you are the company you keep. And, and it, it takes a certain perseverance to keep good company with yourself. Yes. Yes. Yeah. 
yeah and that and that opens up the mind to so many different levels and what that might mean and one's personal experience of that and yes I shall have to go away and have a real think about that Good. yes I, I shall do now <laughs> we're coming to the end of our time together um so I'd like to end with something which I call the luggage in the crypt which is basically this idea that you're being you know, you're at the gates <clears throat> final gates boarding yeah. and uh, for your final journey and you've just been told you've got to take your own entertainment with you <laughs> you are the company you keep so keep <laughs> good company <laughs> <laughs> yes <laughs> Very good. What, Let uh, the last resort amuse yourself. <laughs> <laughs> which is which is very good. I can see you on the Orient Express now. <laughs> Do it. I think that's how you're going to be traveling. I don't know why that image suddenly <laughs> came to my mind, but but beautiful that's table, great. you know, napkins, linen, and absolutely like gorgeous. Great. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> what film would you take with you? Well, that's almost impossible to answer yeah <laughs> really impossible um but i guess it might be ron akira kurosawa's ron but go back to akira kurosawa i mean that yeah. it just has everything in it it has everything in it no there's no stone unturned in that movie no no in, in terms of cinema interest yes it's years and years since i've seen it and i think it, uh, it's prompting me to have another look at it again um a book well that's also really challenging because it's I'm, I'm way into the book i'm reading now um which it which is called these truths these truths right by Jill Lepore, who's an American historian. Right. And, and it's a marvelous, a marvelous history book about the United States. And she really <sighs> took on the challenge of, of, of creating a, a, a whole vision for the history rather than than a, pers a certain perspective and she right. includes so many perspectives in that book and of course you know for the last four years it's all about politics it's all about what's going on mm. and and i'm not mm. sure that's the book that in the end i would take but if i was going to die today that would be the book i would take <laughs> <laughs> Fair you know enough. what i mean yeah yeah. Oh no, no, absolutely. I, I'm always constant. I'm constantly aware um, that whenever I ask these questions, if I ask the same question three weeks from now, it would probably be a different answer. Um, but that sounds a f fascinating. But, but, but she really has opened my eyes to to all of the threads of our history in this country, and oh. and she drawn together so many voices that have. That, that have and remain unheard. And, and, and uh, it's a really important work in, right, right. in terms of, of understanding our history, I think, oh. and the way history is written. Right, right. Making something accessible, particularly in, in history, I think is so important. Yeah, and she's so a good important. storyteller too. She's a really good storyteller. But yeah, this is what you need. This is what you need in a history yeah. book. What about a musical album? Well, this is probably going to be too obscure for anybody, but uh, you know, I practice yoga. Right. And every time I practice yoga, I only listen to one piece of music, and it's by Jai Utah, who is an American um, musician. Jai Utah, and, and, and what I listen to is an album called For Yoga and Other Joys. And it's it's just a marvelous um, meeting intersection of jazz and Eastern meditative music and the Eastern tradition and American 
traditional music. It's amazing. He's an amazing musician. So uh -huh. I, I, I wouldn't want any other piece of music than that. Right. I wouldn't right. need any other piece. Right. You know, much as, I, much as I might like to hear Jesse Norman, you know. <laughs> Just... <laughs> It sounds very relaxing. I, I shall check that one out as well. Oh, about, yeah. You should. What about a favorite food? Well, that would have to be Chilean sea bass. <laughs> <laughs> right in there. Yeah. Right in there. <laughs> Chilean sea bass, period. End right. of story. Okay, fair enough. Now, this is going to be really impossible. What about a piece of visual art? Oh, well. I, you know, at this point in my life, uh, I would have to go with Stonehenge. <laughs> ah, that's fascinating. Have you visited Stonehenge? No, I've only, I've only watched a zillion documentaries about it and read about it. And, oh. and I've studied it from an historical point of view a lot. And but I have been to Peru and seen incredible rock walls, right? Um, like Stonehenge, so I can imagine. Right, know, right. One, I'm sure I will go when the travel ban is lifted. I will get to go to Stonehenge. Check when you, because of course there's only I think it's only on the solstice you're actually allowed to approach the stones themselves. Otherwise, you have to walk around. Of course, when I was a kid, there was none of that. Right. One of my earliest memories is be, is visiting Stonehenge as a kid, and I'd have been about eight years old, something like that, if not younger, and clambering over these damp, gray, wet stuff. It was the mist was all around. I remember oh, very gosh. clearly. How wonderful! And um, yeah, and it, it was it was during the nineteen sixties. Yeah, I was definitely. I remember it was during the nineteen sixties because. Do you know who Twiggy, the model, is? Yeah, remember Twiggy? Oh. Yeah, we was parked up next to a van, um, one of those uh, Volkswagen vans, and there was a long live Twiggy done in um, electrical tape, you know, the very thin <laughs> electrical tape, which my father thought was hilarious that they've done that. Anyway, I digress. I, yes, again. That's all right. um, you know, I, I really think it's so magnificent and it's so old. And it, it continues to um, enthrall, you know, it's so mysterious. And, and of course they're finding out, we were talking about watching documentaries, they've found out so much more than when I was a kid. And oh. I get fascinated, you know, apps on my yeah. iPad about Stonehenge and what, all the different holes they found and what this means, et cetera. Yeah, extraordinary It's like place. the Nazca lines, you know, the Nazca lines. Yeah, in, yeah. Peru. It's the same kind of mystery and ceremony. The scope of it all is yeah. Just... And the, yeah, and, and people spend their time doing this when they, you know, were probably having to. It speaks of a civilization that was able to feed people in order to be able to perform these feats. You know, there's whole things around it. Yeah. Um, what, what's inspiring? What What is the inspiration? Right. Yes, yes, yeah, 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 yeah. And the fact that they brought, you know, they have evidence that people were coming from the other end of our rather long country in order to visit Stonehenge and, and so on. Yeah. Extraordinary. Um, what about a luxury to take with you? <laughs> well, I think everything I mentioned, Nick, is a luxury. Come on. <laughs> so I guess it would have to be Stonehenge. <laughs> That seems fair enough. I, you, <laughs> we'll get you two. You can have it twice as a piece oh, of visual okay. art and as, as you know. No, so I only need Stonehenge, really. Forget yeah, everything just, else. Yeah, yeah. Just take Stonehenge. Yeah. <laughs> that's, that's wonderful. Nancy, so thank you so very much for joining me today. This has been a great deal of fun. Well, Nick, I can't thank you enough for the pleasure. It was really, really great to see you again. And, and I you. just wish you all the best. And, well, and I really am sure we'll meet again one day soon, as the Queen says. Yes, one day. Yes. Fingers <laughs> crossed. Yes. 
it's one day very <laughs> soon and in the in the meantime nancy stay safe and well yes you too you too be well be well take care that was so much fun nancy is such a lovely human being and what fascinating stories and what a very rare treat now next up on our special edition of the chattering hour i'm joined by Courtney Gaines. We talk about his Stephen King film, The Children of the Corn, and so very much more. So join me then for the next episode. Mm -hmm.